Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, attending today's open lecture. It is my own pleasure as the head of communications and marketing here at ESMT Berlin to welcome you to the open lecture. My name is Molly Ilbrock, and um, today's uh, topic is 20 years of ECB monetary policy. We have Philip Hartman. Thank you very much for being with us from the um, European Central Bank. As an international um, business school, ESMT tries to uh, bring together lots of different opinions, different ideas, and different topics in our speakers and events. So we've had this open lecture series since 2009, and it's always a great pleasure to really go back to the roots and have someone from the ECB to have um, a finance topic here today. We're um, looking forward to hear what our guest speaker, Philip Hartman, will say on his expertise on the European Central Bank's monetary policy. Mr. Hartman is the Deputy Director General of Research at the ECB. He coordinates work on financial integration. There's a lot to say about him. He's a fellow um, of the Center for Economic Policy and Research, a member of the Scientific Committee of the, um, I'm just going to say the Foundation of the Bank of France. My French is really, really bad. Um, previously, he worked at the European Monetary Institute and the London School of Economics. He also served as chair, chaired and chaired part-time um, as a part-time professor at Erasmus University Rotterdam and acted as vice president of SURF and a member of the Basel Committee Research Task Force. Mr. Hartman has published research on financial, monetary, and international issues, and he currently serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Financial Stability. His policy work has been published in many official reports and discussed by expert committees, including the ECOFIN Council, the ECB Governing and General Councils, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. So welcome to Philip Hartman. Today's open lecture will be moderated by ESMT President Jörg Rohoy. We will have a question and answer session at the end, but I would like to um, give you the opportunity to ask questions, clarifying questions, during the lecture as well. So before I pass on to Mr. Hartman, I would like to thank our media partners. You see them up here, Der Tagesspiegel and Harvard Business Manager. And please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Hartman. Philip, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? OK, very good. You didn't, I don't need this then. If the, thank you very much for this very nice, well, nice introduction, Molly, if I may. And thank you, Jörg, for letting me have this talk. Um, I'm, one could probably fairly say, uh, one of the pioneers um, in the ECB still left, because I joined the, ECB, the European Monetary Institute in 1997 and made the whole transition to the Euro in 99, and then spent all the 20 years there since then to uh, build up the institution, in particular the research department. And uh, uh, given this fact, uh, Frank Smets, my colleague, who also joined the ECB early in 1999, and I decided when we were approached by the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity to write a piece um, from our angle to celebrate the 20 years of the ECB, which was last year, and the 20 years of the Euro, which is this year, uh, by writing a paper describing the experiences we made with our primary uh, task, which is to conduct the monetary policy for the Euro area. Um, I'm also here, uh, truly here, to answer your question, listen to your thoughts, and uh, we know we have some critiques in this country and in other countries. So I'm also here to listen to if, if there are some critical questions, to answer them and try to do my best to explain our policies. Um, and uh, I can, however, not discuss with you today current monetary policy, uh, because actually on the 7th of March there will be a governing council meeting, like looking forward, and we are in a quiet period. So I clearly can only talk historically with you. So I ask you for your understanding Will that I will comply with our rules of communication in this, in this regard. And obviously, the usual disclaimer applies. So um, all what I have to say are my own views or Frank's views or joint views and not necessarily the views of the ECB or um, the Euro system. So, um, so this is a paper on 20 years of monetary policy history. 
And in this chart, I want to introduce you how we're going to look at the 20 years and make you familiar with the performance in terms of our primary objective, which is to maintain price stability in the euro area. So for the purpose of analyzing, analyzing our monetary policy, we divide these 20 years in four cyclical periods. And if you look at the green line, you see the growth rate of the euro area. And um, the, sh the alternating shaded gray and white areas are these four cyclical periods. And the, 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 the growth rate will show you uh, the ups and downs of the euro area economy in this regard. So we, I will start with a, uh, what we call the end of the uh, technology cycle. Um, uh, then I, we will continue with the economic upturn after that and the buildup of imbalances that ultimately led to the financial crisis in the euro area. And then we'll talk on a third period on the financial, systemic financial and the sovereign debt crisis. And ultimately, I will talk about the last few years, which was a moderate recovery with a, slow inf with a low inflation phenomenon. Um, so let's look at our primary objective, which is to maintain price stability, which we defined uh, as a, um, a rate of consumer price, an annual rate of consumer price inflation of below but close to 2%. So if you would look with me together at the blue line in this chart, and, uh, and the, the, the legend is on the, um, uh, the axis is the left one for the inflation number. This is our headline inflation, HICP inflation rate. And what you can see is that actually... Uh, for the first 10 years, the first two cyclical periods, it stayed relatively close to 2% or just below 2% and relatively closely. But in the second 10 years, starting in 2008, 7 or 8, actually this series, our primary, uh, this uh, headline inflation number became much more volatile, actually fluctuating between values of plus 4.1, actually right before the crisis, and minus 0.7%. However, if you take the average of the inflation rate, which is the dashed blue line in this chart, actually you see that we, in average, actually, the inflation rate was 1.7%. So I would argue that this is below but close to 2%. So on average, we, we complied with our uh, inflation aim of uh, below but close uh, to 2%. Um, how, and an important factor for central banks is not only the current headline inflation, it's also the market's inflation expectations looking forward, which describe the credibility you have in the market to actually deliver price stability in the future. One measure of this, medium term, of medium-term inflation expectations from surveys, is the red line um, in the chart. And you can see that this red line actually hovers... Uh, between 1.8 and 2%. So from the angle of this indicator, actually the ECB actually maintained um, its credibility and anchored inflation expectations close to its uh, inflation aim. Um, uh, something that uh, we, however, have to consider very seriously is that um, the uh, stark volatility of the inflation numbers after 2007, 2008, and also the yellow line in this chart, which is the core inflation, which takes out the volatile components, which are oil and commodity, commodities, um, uh, so which are not subject to the short-term fluctuations, and so which are also relevant to assess inflation developments in the medium term. And there you see that um, particularly in the, uh, in the uh, last period, we had a, a, a period of a prolonged low inflation. And I will talk in depth about this later. Um, uh, core inflation was 1% uh, or below, and even uh, headline inflation hovered around zero for a period of about one and a half years, which, was, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, relatively far to the downside from our in inflation aim. By now, we are more to normal inflation rates, subject to ECB monetary thanks to ECB monetary policy. So this, peer, this paper stops in, in the summer of 2018, the data sample. So uh, at that time, we were around 2%. Now we are again a little bit lower, um, but that is the current monetary policy that I will not um, talk uh, very much about. So this is, our, is kind of an over, bird's eye overview of how we performed in fulfilling our, our, our objective. So let's go step by step through the four periods. What happened in those uh, four periods? Um, 
Now, in January 99, uh, a new institution, well, in, actually in, in, in May 1998, but uh, 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 the euro started in January 99, the ECB started its monetary policy, and it had to deal with two challenges. So first, um, it was a new institution and had to build the credibility quickly, uh, the credibility that I was talking about when talking about inflation expectations, that market would have confidence in us that we maintain price stability. Second, um, it was a time of su substantial structural change. So several central banks were combined into a new euro system and a new economy emerged, an internal uh, a, a euro area for which the monetary policy had to, had to um, operate and maintain price stability. So robustness of the approach that the ECB would take towards its, its task to conduct the monetary policy um, was of the essence. And actually under the leadership of Ottmar Issing, the first chief economist um, of the European Central Bank, the ECB for that purpose actually um, developed a, what it called a stability-oriented monetary policy strategy. Um, it has three components um, in order to achieve this object, this robustness. It had three components. First, a quantitative definition of price stability, initially of below 2% in the medium term, later below but close to percent in the medium term. Um, a two-pillar framework of an economic analysis and a monetary analysis and a communication fra and accountability framework. So um, on the definition of price stability, uh, a novelty for the typical inflation targeting central banks was this medium term in, uh, uh, orientation, which is that the central bank can actually doesn't have to react to any shock that has short, is of a short term nature, but can look through them uh, in order to have a price stability over a longer horizon, three, five years, let's say. Um, and that was actually a feature that then other central banks adopted as well. Uh, more traditional inflation targeting central banks uh, after the ECB had actually adopted it. A discussion emerged fairly quickly about the symmetry of our objective. Remember, I said initially it was below 2% in the medium term. So the upper bound was, clear, was somehow for some observers clearer than the lower bound. Even though policymakers e e uh, explained that our uh, uh, objective was symmetric. So we had to deal with this discussion, it was clarified, and actually this discussion stayed with us for a while. Um, with regard to the pillar framework, um, one of the features that I personally like about it, and still like about it, is that combining an economic pillar and a monetary pillar combines in some way the insights from the two predominant paradigms in macroeconomics in the decades before the euro started, the Keynesian paradigm and the monetarist paradigm. And by having both embedded in our policy strategy, we did not took, take sides in one or the other, but we tried to take the best out of both, in my interpretation. And uh, money initially played a prominent role, as was indicated in Teralia by an announcement of a reference value for M3 growth, against which observers could compare uh, the development, how the monetary policy affected uh, monetary growth and potential inflationary pressures or deflationary pressures coming, disinflationary pressures coming from money growth. Um, in what concerns the, and, 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 what con and that was this two pillar framework was unique. Um, typically you would not have a monetary pillar or uh, something like that in a traditional inflation targeting framework. Um, in the communication framework, we introduced this press conference right after the deliberations, the decisions of the governing council on the monetary policy, which immediately explained the rationale for the, for the decision. This was again something that other central banks like the Federal Reserve, uh, US Federal Reserve and others adopted after, after, after this. Um, there was a discussion at the time about the minutes of our governing council. Uh, this was uh, also going on for quite a long time. By 2015, we actually published so-called accounts um, and dealt to some extent with this type of uh, commentary on our, on our framework. A second feature of the initial setup was our operational framework, which is basically the market operations that are conducted to keep our policy rate, policy interest rate, close to the one decided by the uh, governing council. And um, so this uh, framework was also peculiar in its breadth special in its breadth. So it, it has weekly main refinancing operations, 
which are which uh, where we give liquidity to banks at the current policy rate at the time the main refinancing operation rate it had a corridor system of standing facilities a deposit facility and a marginal lending facility which created a corridor for money market rates which also helped keep the policy the market rates close to our policy rates and it had a uh, broad set of collateral because the liquidity we give, we give only against adequate collateral and a large number of counterparties. This will become very relevant when the financial crisis strikes. This is why I go about, about some length, in some length about it. Um, if we could switch to the first hyperlink called um, first cycle period. Okay, so this is some of the data um, that... Uh, uh, you could see at the time, uh, between 99, it was the period January 99 to June 2003, which was this end of the technology cycle. So what you, s um, at the time, so um, the uh, euro area economy and the world economy came out of the Asian financial crisis, the um, uh, LTCM crisis, and growth was relatively low, but then picked up. And... Um, uh, so uh, uh, when it was still low, the ECB cut interest rates, but then after the growth picked up uh, in this uh, remaining upturn from the, from the technology developments, uh, the ECB started to, to raise uh, interest rates. Um, it, the, initially, the interest rate uh, decisions, there was a cut of 50 basis points in 99 and an increase for 50 basis points in 99 was uh, uh, not perfectly anticipated by market participants, but uh, shortly after that, actually, uh, we became fairly pre predictable for market participants. And now, in terms of if you make a study of the empirical predictability of our interest rates in, uh, decisions, typically we are very comparable to the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, or other, uh, other central banks. So it was um, established pretty quickly this kind of predictability of our, of our actions against the background of our new strategy. Um, this period, was, you may remember, was characterized by this long depreciation of the euro, which is the light blue line you see on the right-hand side, which actually ended with concerted foreign exchange interventions by the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of England. Obviously, this and other factors uh, led to some um, inflationary pressures, which you see that the blue line up here, uh, moves upwards up to a level of around 3%. Um, uh, and so the ECB had to react to, to, to show for the first time its anti-inflationary resolve, its credibility in fighting inflation. And it did by a, a la number of uh, interest rate hikes that you see in the yellow line on the, on the right-hand right -hand side. And this depreciation was actually after short, sometimes stopped through the foreign exchange intervention. Um, but then the dot-com bubble had already burst and a downturn followed. And suddenly, the uh, perspective reversed. So in order to react to the disinflationary forces from the downturn, from the popping of the dot-com bubble, the ECB had to cut interest rates by quite a bit. And you see, actually, inflation stays pretty close to the blue line uh, to 2%. Uh, so in that regard, these measures were uh, uh, successful. But um, uh, the interest rate went down to a level of 2%, which was historically low for the euro area, or euro area for, for average euro area countries, let's say. Actually, in the US, they went even down to 1%. This led, at the time, to a debate about the lower bound of interest rates for central banks. Now, interest rate is typically used to be bounded by zero. Today, it's not totally bounded by zero any longer, but um, it was. So, coming close, there was a discussion already then about the ability of central banks with low rates, actually, if inflation would go down further, actually, their ability to re-stimulate the economy being constrained with their, with their uh, interest rates already at the time. So, and that actually triggered a discussion about the definition of price stability, and uh, which fed into a review of our strategy, which is at the start of the next period. There was a second um, event, and if you could go now to the back and then click on the uh, hyperlink for de de what's called the decoupling chart. What you see here is that as the dot-com bubble burst, the blue line, which is the credit to the private sector, declined quite a bit. It's a downturn where less, less credit is given. But our monetary aggregate M3, which we look at against the reference value, which is this dashed line, which is the level of 4.5, started to go up. Uh, so, and actually, 
there were reverse uh, developments in money and credit, which uh, somehow undermined the um, discussion, the use of the monetary uh, pillar um, in, in the monetary policy decision. And that also fed into our revision of the, of this, of the monetary policy strategy. If you could go back, please, to the main presentation. Thank you. So that leads us to the second period, which is from July 2003 to July, July 2007, which we call economic upturn and growing imbalances without leaning against the wind. So there was a review of the strategy, and in, in response to the two of the facts that I was just describing and other uh, considerations, Ottmar Issing had considered to uh, review the strategy after, f after f four years, and actually there were some uh, amendments in its formulation made. For example, it was clarified that the inflation should be below but close to 2%. So this was supposed to give uh, uh, the clarification of the lower bound of the objective was meant to give uh, um, a more room for the interest rates to go down because in terms of the inflation expectations, market would factor in, could, uh, could, it would be avoided that market, market fa markets would factor in too low inflation rates, um, okay, by set setting a lower bound, a clearer uh, lower bound uh, to the downside. And the annual review of the reference value was discontinued. Remember the crossing of the money and the credit aggregates. And also in the introductory statement of the press conference, the order of the economic and monetary analysis was reversed. So it, from since then it started with the economic analysis and the forecasts, which were published since 2000. And the monetary analysis was only uh, used uh, in second in the introductory statement and as a cross-check against the, uh, for the results on the economic analysis, a cross-check from a medium to long-term perspective of the results of the economic analysis, including the forecasts, um, uh, in including the forecasts. Uh, these changes were quite applauded by observers of the ECB at the time, which were given the existing views in macroeconomics, were a bit uh, suspicious or like uh, less confident about our monetary pillar, so this somewhat downgrading of the monetary pillar and the clarification of a greater symmetry of the objective created confidence in our observers, for, in particular in academic circles. But nevertheless, the discussion on monetary, the monetary pillar, the monetary analysis continued. And uh, we actually held a conference in 2006 to discuss it and decided to un enter a, a, a broad-based research program to broaden its, 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 its nature. And also the asymmetry discussion, even with the clarification of below but close to 2%, uh, did not leave us and stayed with us for some time, which will be relevant when we talk about the zero lower bound or the lower bound of interest rates in the, um, in the, uh, in the crisis period. So uh, in, in this period, interest rates uh, stayed uh, um, flat uh, for two and a half years at these 2%. If you could now click on the hyperlink second cycle uh, period, which is the one to the left. Um, so as you see, the yellow line is flat on two, uh, f two, and then as the recovery out of the popping of the dot-com bubble gained momentum, which is the green line, which is the growth rate on the left-hand chart, um, uh, and the inflation went down, the ECB started at some point to, to, to raise interest rates to keep uh, inflation close to its aim. And as you see, the blue line is again very close to below but close to 2%, so it's like very close to the objective of 2%, so um, uh, this worked uh, in, the, in the desired uh, way. However, uh, remember we are now in the period, the years before the crisis. So what you see here is this tremendous credit and money growth that happened, or the significant credit and money growth that went up, and I just have it here for two reasons. So first, that led to a debate about whether monetary policy should actually do something about it. So whether monetary policy, given this credit growth, should actually lean, what, what's called in the monetary policy circles, lean against the wind. So normally you have prudential policies to deal with financial stability and the build-up of financial imbalances, but then there was starting to be a discussion whether monetary policy should pay more attention to credit and asset prices and whether it should lean against the wind of this of this uh, credit growth. And actually our strategy with this monetary pillar, which also included this uh, um, credit uh, developments, actually was well designed to observe these things and pay attention to these things. Although, in the end, I will show you a uh, results of a simple uh, policy rule analysis in a moment, 
where, from which you will see that actually the ECB did not actively lean against the wind, even though, even though that was, and actually most other central banks didn't either. So actually that wasn't, it didn't go beyond its normal reaction to inflation developments just to contain credit developments. Okay, but you have to remember at the time ECB was not a banking supervisor and uh, had a very limited uh, contributing role to financial stability and banking stability matters. Um, now, of course, with this credit growth went along the buildup of the imbalances uh, that ultimately lead, uh, led to uh, the, the European part of the, of the crisis. If you could go back to the main presentation, please. I will not uh, go in detail uh, uh, explaining the crisis. We have uh, another paper we're working on where we look at the financial stability experiences of the ECB. I will try to continue focusing on the monetary policy, but just to mention that there were these buildup of current account imbalances within the monetary union, these cross-border capital flows, uh, large ones from, for example, center countries to periphery countries, accompanied by the diverging competitiveness developments in the industries, credit and house price uh, growth. Uh, and some countries had already or built uh, increased uh, public or private uh, debt overhangs. And uh, when the Lehman Brothers then happened, then actually uh, 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 this was also transmitted to the euro area. Let me talk about the third period, the experiences of the third period. So that's now the crisis period. So it's uh, August 2007 to June 2013. Um, we further divide the crisis periods in three sub-periods. So the early period we, was at the time called market turmoil. Um, uh, then after, between those, <laughs> as a, it makes them one smile today, I, I agree. But uh, at the time, people didn't know how bad the situation was. We learned it over time, many, uh, the other central banks as well. Uh, then came after Lehman Brothers, September 08, came the, what, we, what we call the systemic financial crisis. And then in 2010, started on top of all this, the European sovereign debt crisis. Now, in the early parts, what is called market turmoil, um, in our, our operational framework took center stage. We operated under something that has been called a separation principle, where the interest rate was kept at the pr appropriate level for the monetary policy, and the market turbulences were kind of the effects that could have on disturbing our stance, uh, was actually dealt with the market operations, with the liquidity media, with liquidity measures, with the liquidity provisions. So the ECB fa reacted fairly in a classical lender of last resort for an illiquid banking system. Yeah, somehow, very quite quite close to textbook in, in this regard with its liquidity management. And our operational framework, which remember had a wide set of collateral, many instruments and many counterparties that we could reach was actually quite well designed to do this. We reached, other central banks had more problems to reach their counterparts or to stabilize the system with liquidity operations because they did not have as large, for example, a set of uh, counterparties. But then uh, the events of Lehman Brothers unfolded and uh, the crisis turned into a systemic one. And the ECB reacted, uh, like many central banks, with tremendous interest rate cuts, uh, 400 basis points in nine months. Um, and also it, it, it is adopted a new approach to its market operations called fixed rate full allotment, where at a fixed interest rate, the central banks could take all the liquidity, the banks could take all the liquidity they needed as long as they had enough collateral to hold against it. Okay, and that led to a situation of excess liquidity in the banking system, which then pushed the market rates down to not anymore to our main refinancing rate as policy rates, but to the lower bound of the corridor, the deposit facility rate. And in total, that amounted to a decline of 400 basis points um, in, in, in official rates over a period of nine months. Now, the third uh, period, the sovereign debt crisis, is special to the euro area, uh, which had to do with the things that I explained, with the debt overhangs in some countries, and that actually there was a, uh, a combination of banking problems and sovereign problems that actually reinforced each other. Um, and uh, this uh, created uh, tremendous headwinds to our monetary policy. Um, and so uh, several measures were taken. Um, including, for example, our securities markets program, our first uh, interventions in the government bond market, purchases of government bonds. Um, and this was uh, somehow successful in limiting the uh, volatility in government bonds 
and in limiting the increase of the uh, government bonds in some of the stressed countries, but it didn't con couldn't contain it. There were a variety of reasons about it. It was still limited in scope. It was temporary and a number of other reasons that didn't make that as powerful. And we, uh, as you can imagine, the uh, government bond rates that were, uh, whose distortions were addressed by this kind of measure, for example, among others, was very important that our monetary policy stance would be transmitted into the economy in order to achieve our, our objective of uh, price stability. So, um, so many people uh, internationally have criticized the ECB with why it didn't intervene more forceful uh, in, in these circumstances. I mean, you are a German audience, so you may have the opposite maybe view because Germany grew since, t grows since 25 years with a short interruption in, uh, uh, in 2009. Um, and therefore, but we look at the euro as a whole, as an entity, and um, uh, there the situation was, uh, was, uh, was very different. So, um, so basically, uh, the, the situation was characterized by the list of these four things that are in the slide on the right-hand side here. So we're lingering fiscal and banking uh, problems, which caused major problems to the monetary transmission, to our monetary transmission, in which by now one knew some of which were or important ones were solvency problems and not liquidity problems. That led, give rise to severe propagation mechanisms. One is the so-called sovereign bank nexus, that the stabilization of the banks, destabilization of the banks, destabilizes the sovereigns, and the, so the destabilization of the fiscal authorities destabilizes the banks. And moreover, later, it even uh, added that was redenomination risks as some people started to flirt with uh, countries potentially leaving uh, the euro area. And um, it, however, if you think about the sources of these problems, the banking and the sovereign problems, they were firmly outside the remit of the, uh, of the ECB. And uh, for a long time, these problems were not addressed in, force, in, in Europe in a forceful enough way um, uh, since the competencies were at the national level for fiscal policy and for prudential policy. And actually, uh, some countries could not uh, do this uh, uh, to, 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 solve, to, to do the bank resolution or to uh, restore their fiscal uh, health. And uh, of course, in a group of countries, they, you could have uh, done that together. But for a long time, uh, when the crisis was not yet as bad, there was this collective action problem of the, act of the countries acting together to, to stabilize each other it took a very long time. They couldn't be resolved for a very long, to very long time. And what we argue is that um, uh, these forces, which were outside the remit of the ECB, um, were so strong relative to the means that, that could be used that made it so difficult to have a very, a, a, a initially a very strong, a much more powerful reaction to the sovereign, sovereign debt crisis. That's the view that we take in this paper. Particularly, the ECB has to respect Article 123 of the treaties, which is the prohibition of monetary financing, and which prohibits basically to, re to directly recapitalize banks or to uh, finance directly governments. Um, and absent certain institutions that would deal at a collective level, at a euro area wide level with fiscal problems and banking problems, um, the ECB had to balance not to be dragged into things that are very close or even direct, uh, direct monetary financing and to have powerful reactions to the, uh, to the crisis. And uh, we think that this explains that what some of our observers described as relatively timid early response to, this, to the sovereign debt crisis. But then came a turning point, which the turning point, we date them with the uh, famous council meeting in Brussels in June 2012, where actually the European Banking Union was agreed among leaders. And also shortly before the countries had agreed to make the temporary European financial stability facility permanent and establish a European stability mechanism, which would be, be started to operate in October 2010 which was a much more credit, both these measures, the single supervisory uh, authority that would be created in the banking union and the single resolution mechanism, at least at the start, that would be created, um, actually were uh, credible enough um, uh, measures to solve the fiscal and banking problems in the euro area. And in this new context, in this new context where these were more under the control, the collective action problems had been taken care of, in a more credible way, actually the ECB could step 
to another level of unconventional policy measures to stem the adverse effects of the crisis on its monetary policy. And that is actually the moment when, you remember after uh, the Mario Draghi held the famous speech uh, in July 2012 about uh, ECB will do whatever it takes um, uh, within its mandate to preserve the euro. And then, actually, a few months later, established the Outright Monetary Transaction Program, which was a powerful program to intervene in government bond markets, one of the one very important transmission channels of monetary policies, government bond rates. Um, if the country was under a functioning program of the uh, adjustment program of the ESM, which would take care of the banking side and the fiscal side. So we could be confident that it would be taken care of and that our interventions would not lead countries actually not to solve or the euro area not to solve these banking and financial problems which would drag us closer and closer to a risk of entry ending up in monetary monetary financing and that was the turning point of the crisis so let's for a moment pause in the different periods how much um because we will now look at the uh, assess uh, our um, our monetary policy with a simple interest rate rule, which you see on this chart. Um, uh, and so the purpose here is to see whether we have actually had a consistent approach uh, to uh, interest rate policy and um, until the our interest rates hit zero lower bound, which was in July 2012, after these very tremendous interest rate cuts. So what I want to quickly show you, this is a standard so-called Ofanidis rule. It has lots of things you can talk about uh, in this regard, which has been found to be relatively robust. The formula is on the upper end chart. So, um, the so basically the blue line is the interest rate changes that the ECB did. And the, the corridor, the shaded corridor in light blue, is actually what the rule would predict, the estimated rule would predict, if we say uh, the uh, uh, if we define our objective between 1.5 and 2 percent inflation, just to not, you know because we have like a, not a point target, point objective, we have you know we have this below but close to 2 percent, which we operationalize for the purpose of this rule by for 1.5 to 2 percent. So that defines this range. The first thing you see is that. And, and the novelty here, the contribution to the literature, is that we actually do it with the ECB forecast. So this rule, which actually describes interest rate changes as a function from the deviation of the inflation objective and the deviation of real GDP growth from uh, potential GDP growth, um, actually predicts the interest rate uh, changes pretty well. So this, would, this chart would suggest that we behaved according to consistently against the background of what we learned from our forecasts, okay? And so that's the good news. Second, I promised to you I would say something about leaning against the wind. So if you look at the 2.3 to 2.7 period, um, you see that there are these um, uh, interest rate increases that happened before the crisis when the, there was the upswing. But um, um, we did not, our interest rate, uh, the blue line doesn't go above the shaded light blue range, which would be the rule uh, predicted by the, 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 the decisions predicted by the rule. So if we had leaned against the wind beyond our normal monetary policy reaction, we would have the blue line above the shaded light blue range. Okay, so as I said to you, there was no evidence of that. Then there's a lot of discussion on two interest rate decisions that shortly before Lehman in the summer, we increased rates in uh, July uh, 2007. So actually the rule suggests actually that this went in the wrong direction. Right, because the light, the shaded blue actually goes down, and uh, these, there was still this, this, this small increase. There was another one, which is actually in 2011, before the sovereign debt crisis worsened. Up here, you see two 25 basis point increases, but that one is in line with our forecasts. As you see, the shaded blue line actually would even have told us we should have raised rates earlier. ECB is an international circus, sometimes in, um, criticized for these two interest rate decisions, um, saying they were like. Uh, um, they were premature uh, because the crisis was coming. But of course, people say that with hindsight, if you take this real-time perspective, well, the, the, the first one comes out as a small error, uh, uh, but the second one doesn't, and uh, they're actually small. So I would, we would argue in the paper, we do argue that actually these tremendous obstacles to the monetary policy from the fiscal and the lingering banking problems, which f went on for over many years and were only resolved as of the summer 2012, were much larger forces for the downturn that led to this low inflation period than these 
interest rate uh, changes, which is the, the stance uh, we, we take. There's lots of things you can say. For example, there's this symmetry debate. We test for asymmetry in our reaction to inflation being above or below target. We don't find it. There's no evidence of asymmetry, despite observers continuing to claim that, that our objective um, is, is uh, symmetric. And there are many other things we can say, but in the interest of time, I will hurry ahead and talk quickly about the fourth period. Um, which is uh, June thir July 13 to June 2018, the latest few years. Now, by that time, in 2013, the damage of the sovereign debt crisis was done. So we had low inflation, very low inflation, de-anchoring risks increasing, inflation expectations de-anchoring risks increasing, and even s uh, indicators of um, in deflation risks showing higher probabilities. In this uh, situation, the ECB actually adopted a three-pronged approach, um, which is listed there, where we moved for the first time into negative interest rates in small steps, up to, in the end, uh, minus 40 basis points, um, introduced targeted long-term refinancing operations, which is called funding for lending, where banks get incentive to get actually very cheap funding if they are afterwards lend a lot to the, to the economy and stimulate by that. And we actually made the step, remember that's the new environment where the institutions have been developed in the area to a, a public sector purchase program, which is quantitative easing. So the ECB did quantitative easing monetary policy much later than many other central banks. And in January 2015, as part of this three-pronged approach that happened, we also did changes to our communication. So in particular, the most important change to our communication was that we introduced forward guidance. So by telling the market that we will hold rates low for a longer period of time in the future, you have an additional easing even though your, your interest rate is, is bounded to the downside because you, markets can rely that they will stay low for longer. This all led to a discussion on the sequencing, the rationale, the costs and benefits of these measures. Many things were discussed. The effectiveness, I will give you some numbers towards the end, uh, which is nigh the end. Um, <laughs> on the effectiveness and uh, about the effects of negative rates, how bad is that for the financial system, uh, uh, even distributional effects, does ad do asset purchases actually lead to making rich people richer and poor people poorer? We can take all this up in the discussion if you wish. Um, uh, but what one cannot deny is that actually, if you compare with our peers, actually the ECB has become, with our measures, more similar to the major other central banks. Um, and for what it's worth. And um, so we are actually do have done in many respects things that are similar to what other central banks have done. Um, I wanted to show you, I don't have the time any longer, uh, an indication how severe the de-anchoring risks were in 2014 when we adopted this three-pronged approach of additional easing that ultimately led to quantitative easing. I can take it up in the discussion if you wish. There were very serious uh, de-anchoring risks to inflation expectations. Um, and I wanted to give you an overview of our unconventional measures. Um, uh, we have talked about them step by step going through the history, but I think this takes a very long time if I now go through this full uh, thing. You, you can look it up in the paper. Uh, this uh, table describes this complex world of unconventional monetary policy, which makes monetary much more difficult to understand because it's not, you don't have just the interest rate you look at. You have to look at all types of things that are described here and there is a structure imposed on it so that one can see what type of instruments at, were used at which time and what, what type of problems they addressed and what nature they had. But again, I don't have the time to, to go walk with you through all, uh, through, through all this. So let me conclude. Um, I would argue that overall the ECB has delivered on its price stability mandate, albeit with increasing difficulty in, against the fallout of the sovereign debt crisis, which was, remember, at the start, this long period of low inflation, and then at some point even um, uh, deflation risks increasing. Um, but we would argue that um, this had a lot to do, uh, what people, some of our critiques say, that we should have acted more decisively around that time had a lot to do with a, a lack of setup in the euro an institutional setup that allowed the collective action problems for the national policies in in fiscal on the fiscal side and on the banking side to be resolved quickly and uh, since the institutions were not there we were kind of constrained what we could do and uh, not uh, not wanting to violate the the monetary financing prohibition the strategy and framework that we adopted early on, remember the early slides, served us well, primarily also because we changed them when it was needed. 
Okay? So, initially, the policy strategy gave a prominent role for money, which helped dispel early questions about the ECB's anti-inflationary resolve. When interest rates became low for the first time, remember, 2% in uh, 2002, uh, 2003, and so on, um, it, the inflation aim was clarified to below but close to 2%, which added a buffer to the lower bound uh, of interest rates and the inflation. Um, the economic analysis and quarterly projections gained prominence when the monetary aggregates um, were harder to interpret. I showed you the reverse developments of credit and, and money. Um, and, uh, and, and so the monetary analysis was uh, given a role as a cross-check. Uh, the breadth of the ECB's market operation framework allowed it to react quickly in the early phases of the crisis. And after the sovereign debt crisis, when the effective lower bound became increasingly a constraint, the ECB significantly expanded its non-standard tools to quantitative easing, negative rates, forward guidance, proving its anti-deflationary resolve. Um, the extension of the monetary analysis, I told you about a conference, about uh, a research program that we had, helped us a lot in the crisis because it allowed us to analyze better many of these uh, transmission problems, impairments in the financial system, and to uh, understand better the effectiveness of some of the unconventional responses to them. Overall, by doing all this, we came closer uh, to its, our peers, but also some of our uh, work has been... Um, adopted also by other central banks, inspired other central banks. I mentioned the medium-term orientation of the objective. I mentioned the monetary policy press conference and the breadth and flexibility of our operational framework. But the incompleteness of EMU and imperfections in fiscal and prudential policies could continue uh, to cause significant headwinds to monetary policy if things go bad. So some issues have been addressed in, very, in a series of very serious reforms like the European Stability Mechanism, the Banking Union, and uh, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure in the EU. Um, so the ECB would benefit tremendously for a thorough inter implementation of these reforms and from compliance with their objectives. For our angle, it would, of course, be better if further reforms could take place and further progress in completing the economic and monetary union could be made, for example, along the lines of the five presidents report that the five presidents of the European Union wrote in 2015. Let me stop here and sorry for overrunning the pre-agreed time. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you very much, <coughs> Philip, for <coughs> such a comprehensive um, description of what the ECB has done, uh, where it's uh, actually how it has operated through the different uh, phases. So as always, uh, I, would I would obviously have a couple of questions, but I will start only with a few and then uh, leave it open to you to um, address um, additional questions you may have. And I'd like to actually start with one point that, that you mentioned, which is this um, the incompleteness uh, and therefore maybe also the lack of... Um, or let's say the, the, the problems one, the ECB may have in figuring out how to have the best possible transmission mechanism. Uh, where would you see the most important need for reforms in order to provide uh, the, the fiscal, the monetary framework for, for the central bank to operate? Yeah. So the two areas, uh, t so there are many areas, but uh, two areas that are very prominent are obviously uh, the fiscal side and the banking side. Uh, let me particularly focus um, on the banking side, and actually work is going on in European authorities in those directions. So uh, it would be the completion of the banking union. Um, so uh, that means uh, something that is uh, in principle already agreed and is, is, is being worked on now is uh, to pro provide a backstop to the single resolution mechanism, a fiscal, like a fiscal backstop, um, a full backstop. And uh, to uh, something that is not popular in this country, to um, introduce also the European Deposit Insurance, um, for, uh, which is the third leg that uh, was initially in the plan of the banking union, but at, at this point um, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, adopted or uh, being introduced. So um, if you have uh, what we have now, the single supervisory mechanism at the ECB as the first leg of the banking union, the single resolution mechanism, plus a credible backstop on the fiscal side for it, um, and uh, European deposit insurance, I think we are much better prepared and even better. Per so it was already the progress with the first two legs was very important, but the other things that I mentioned are also important and we would be much better prepared if banking problems would um, 
uh, would emerge for some reason or another uh, to resolve them rather quickly and not have these several years of period where actually uh, uh, banking problems would actually not allow monetary policy to transmit it very well through the, through the banking system. Mm. Yeah, thank through. you. Um, the other uh, question, and, and you alluded to some of the criticism uh, the ECB faces, and say one of them is that uh, the concern is, and this is probably not really a criticism of the ECB, but maybe rather of the political um, actors, that there's an overburdening of central banks by uh, having to do too much. Uh, when one thinks back, for example, of the uh, famous speech, whatever it takes in, in the summer of 2012, it probably would have been very unlikely for, say, parliaments also here um, to come up with additional uh, rescue me measures uh, in various countries so that in the end um, it could only be the ECBS, you could say, the last uh, lender of last resort. The lender of last resort. Um, in that sense, uh, how, uh, how do you think of this um, overburdening or the, the, the question of overburdening when in particular the, the price stability mandate is at, at the core function? Yeah. Um, so this is intimately related to the reforms we are talking about. Uh, the better the monetary union functions at other ends, the less likely it is that this um, overburdening est establish itself. Um, I mean, it, it, it is, uh, so, I mean, people often said ECB was the only game in town because we were described as the only properly functioning, uh, really uh, operationally functioning uh, European institution. And um, and therefore we could uh, you know handle a lot of the problems that uh, or address in, in within our mandate a lot of the problems that that emerged, um, but by doing this of course um, a lot of reservations many observers have a lot of reservations whether we enter in other become too close in other uh, policy areas. Or um, uh, countries are very diverse in the euro. One of our big problems is that you know some countries uh, grow better, others grow less, others some have higher, lower inflation, and therefore um, they uh, they have different different views on the perspective. So, and if you're very expansionary, and uh, the people in the country that actually grows already quite well or has good employment, actually they may have large reservations to being hurt by low interest rates for their savings and so on. So, the popular support reduces. And I, I don't know, I don't hear many people saying this, but I felt always, if I think about before EMU, what was the strength of the Bundesbank? Why was the Bundesbank so successful for Germany in running the monetary policy? Many people would say, yeah, was it independence? It was written very clearly in the law, in the Bundesbank law, that it's very independent and you can't, the government can't intervene. I would, yes, that was important. In my view, however, the big strength is that the pop German citizens trusted the Bundesbank. They, didn't, they had a lot of confidence that it would do the right policies, and that is very important. So if you are uh, forced into going in a lot of uh, extreme policies um, that actually are difficult to understand for people, you may lose that. You may lose some of the people, uh, and uh, that then will lead uh, to a uh, st starting process of political interference also, commentary on the monetary policy, which we normally wouldn't see in a normal, in a normal situation. So that's how I think about it. Um, uh, you have to be, uh, these reforms are very important, and we, we rely on them because actually uh, them actually being implemented properly allows us to focus on the core of our mandate and therefore not to be dragged in things where Increasing number of people are, have reservations, and therefore the support that we have in politically, but also in the people, in the population, uh, actually is undermined. Mm -hmm. And that's a key factor, in my view. Uh, the, um, the other criticism uh, here is regarding, I mean, in particular, this is not ECB-related, but the criticism regarding uh, the deposit insurance um, and other mechanisms uh, often centers on the question, what is the fiscal consequence for, for uh, Germany? Maybe um, put differently, uh, wouldn't it also... Um, makes sense to think more about the market integration which is independent of fiscal measures, so strengthening of capital markets, of equity markets, that uh, in a sense could be at least an alternative to um, the buffers that may come from the fiscal side. Yeah. Yes, so um, we do that. Actually, I didn't say it, but in part of the reforms that we support very much is the so-called capital markets union. I actually myself and a team of people work on that and have proposals how we can make it more powerful. For example, having larger equity markets and more integrated equity markets, for example, how we can perform that. And that's absolutely part of the equation uh, with other things that we, that we have discussed. One of the problems is that when you talk about the banking sector or the financial sector more generally, 
uh, you cannot just split the banking sector in the part that is not fiscal and the part that is fiscal. It just doesn't work. It's not how, if you have a banking problem, first of all, you don't know when it starts, and then you learn, and it's very rare that you can handle the things without any fiscal arrangement. So if you talk about financial integration, we cannot just say we want financial integration only that is independent of fiscal matters. And that doesn't lead to some countries paying something or so much, or there needs to be a backstop for some countries that may, have, may not have the fiscal capacity to deal with certain banking problems. So we have done a lot of things. We have introduced bail-in and things that reduce the role of fiscal authorities, hopefully better in the future, um, in uh, managing banking problems. We've done a lot of things. But um, it's just not realistic to think that if, if a new banking problem should emerge, an instability problem, that you can just focus on an integration that has no implications for fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. Having said that, our work suggests actually we have a lot of proposals in, along the line of the capital market union to actually enhance private financial risk sharing coming from financial markets. And actually that is trying to get, make actually distinct proposals um, about what you can do to foster the private side of what would stabilize the euro area. At the same time, however, we know that even that, uh, if you think about the results about risk sharing across US states, for example, the numbers that we know uh, actually um, probably rely on the fact of being a very strong sovereign behind it mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the public side. So even that will not be entirely independent, I'm afraid. Okay, so I have one more question and then obviously I'm delighted to open the floor. Um, the, the big question that is now in the room, and I think it was even voiced today uh, by the president of the Bundesbank, is how to get out of these unconventional measures. So basically, uh, rather than, I mean, before, uh, you always risk uh, falling down the cliff, but uh, no matter when, at some point, it, it has to happen. Uh, so this was basically what I think what he said. But the question is really, um, now how, uh, and I'm not talking about interest rate policy, as you said, you, you can't comment, and which is fully understood, but uh, how to now uh, get out of this rather unusual circumstance? <laughs> so I should not talk about it, but I should talk about it. Oh, no, 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 just not the interest rate policy, right? <laughs> so, uh, okay, I cannot talk about the future. I'm sorry, I'm bound by mm -hmm. the quiet period. But let me just say that, um, first of all, uh, some important steps have already been done. As you may recall, at the end of last year, our asset purchase program was uh, uh, finished. So the net asset purchases are now not. So um, there's only kept the stock of assets constant through reinvestments for the moment. So there's no further net asset purchase as there have been for a long period of time on our asset purchase program. So I think that is an important uh, step that has already been done. Uh, the other thing is you have to look at the economy. So if the economy grows and inflation uh, risks are to the upside, you can uh, uh, take accommodation out. But if things develop, and lately we have seen a number of things that actually uh, uh, led to conclusions of uh, slower um, uh, recovery, uh, more uh, uh, the upside risks get to the price of getting less, so maybe some downside risks coming in. Think about Brexit, think about trade wars, um, uh, and so on. Uh, so if the economy uh, is slowing down, you have to run the monetary policy to maintain price stability. You have to look at that. And that will determine going forward. Um, it will be data dependent. It will be looked at what is the evidence. It will be looked at on the 7th of March, what do our forecasts say? And the monetary policy will have to do what ensures price stability against the evolution of the economy. No, and, not, uh, and, 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 and yes, uh, we, everybody would like to um, uh, exit unconventional measures, but you also have to have a stance that speaks to the situation with price stability. No, and, and if it turns the other way, you have to react in a way that uh, it actually does what it has to do, what our mandate says we have to do. Thank you. So are there questions? Please. monetary policy could be even more efficient. Would you agree with that, or is it totally irrelevant what's happening in the real economy, what the labor market is concerned? Thank you. Yeah, the labor market is very important for monetary policy. There are concepts like the Phillips curve, which link uh, inflation and, uh, and employment, for example. It's ups of, so every monetary policy preparation has a very important labor market component, because, for example, wages are a very important factor in price developments, no? the wage developments, in the firm's price developments. Um, European unemployment insurance, that was the start of the question. Um, 
uh, is, so it is outside of our remit, so we would not, uh, unless asked, we would not uh, uh, give advice or say, say uh, uh, this or that or the other would have to be done. But one good thing, if there was such a thing, is that if you have in a large economic area a cross-regional unemployment scheme and you have some regions being on the good side of things, in the gro have facing growth, others facing a decline in higher unemployment, then money flows from the stronger parts to the weaker parts through, uh, in, in a quasi-automatic way, in a well-designed unemployment insurance. That's a form of risk sharing, okay? And as long as the structural policies are done in a way in that economic area, that this is conjunctural, so there's not a secular decline where the money always flows just in one direction, but you basically, there are cyclical developments and sometimes one uh, region uh, benefits and sometimes another region. This can be a very powerful mechanism. Now then there are many practical problems to have that in the euro area in the EU. It's a, it's a big step, but if you look at it from the stabilization policy, macroeconomic stabilization policy of the euro area, such a scheme can be very helpful it's, if it's well designed. We have one more question. Yes. Uh, oh. Yeah. I must admit, I'm not very deeply in your topic, but a while ago I looked on what you put in your inflation, what is counted for inflation. And if I look, if I understood it correctly, then we have that what we all think about industrial stuff being produced and bought. And then we have a big area like healthcare and care at all, where we have totally different mechanism in how markets are made, if we talk at all about markets. So at that point of time, it was said we had to increase inflation. And I thought about what could I do as an individual to increase inflation. I have more need for health care, which is on a diff totally different area. How is that handled that we have in, a, in our population Markets which are closed, which are set by government, which where we are lacking people, so we would have a high need for employment. Uh, do what I want to say: Do we not have a misperspective on the data which we look at in terms of inflation? Some people may be surprised. This is an excellent question uh, because. In our price indices that we look at, very different products are in there. And in fact, with structural change in the economy, and I will come to health prices, which is just one of the issues, um, uh, some, the structural change leads to changes in price setting behavior. Okay? And so, and they're different for different economic sectors. Think, for example, of online, online shopping. Okay, uh, so the one question is whether uh, people discussing, there's a literature about that, whether the fact that you can now buy and compare all types of prices on the internet makes you much more effective to find the lowest, the cheapest price. And therefore, actually, it should have downward pressure on, at least temporarily, on price, on inflation developments. And then the question is, is that really picked up by the statisticians? Do they have enough um, online prices actually in the price indices, and yes, they do catch up. They have more and more, they actually adjust to the structural change, but also the structural change is at a higher speed than it used to be. So there are a number of areas that actually where um, uh, we, are, we, we are still studying, we actually in the ECB uh, starting a research network about this, to look at even micro price setting to make sure that in the low inflation problem that we have since a couple of years, Actually, we understand well enough the different forms of price setting in different sectors for very, under very different structural changes. Now, the healthcare um, is a very special uh, sector in itself, together with a few others, because it has a lot of administered prices. No, it's not pre free price setting. So for medicine, there in, 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 in a, uh, is, is an involvement of the public sector very often, and so on. And also people are more dependent on it, so you can't, it's not like choosing, do I choose a Golf or do I choose a Ferrari? <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, if I need a certain medicine, I have to take it. So... Um, it's, it's different. But so the, the one thing is that, yes, indeed, administered prices um, sometimes can give distorted signals. 
But what one would hope is that uh, usually you wouldn't expect that to happen in many sectors at the same time, so that hopefully our gauge for monetary policy, this price setting, is actually still accurate in the aggregate in what is what we, what we are looking at. And what we are looking at is consumer price inflation so that all you, all the citizens, have, have on average across the basket that as a rule you tend to consume in the euro area stable prices, below but close to 2%. And, and yes, uh, these factors are important, and we actually have increased our efforts in the research department of the ECB to understand some of the subsectors and the special effects that we have under digitization and, uh, and a number of other things that we could go into. But um, yeah. So we have time maybe for one final question. Do we have... Uh, yeah, please. Um, I work for, as an economist for ING. First, uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, very interesting indeed. I would like to pick on the, uh, uh, the, the discussion that we just had on, on European deposit insurance, but not to talk about deposit insurance, but about the other topic that plays a role there, namely the risk weighting of, um, uh, of sovereigns. Because uh, one of the issues that we face uh, as ING, which is, very much, uh, which is an institution very much in favor of completing the banking union as soon as possible, uh, being a European-oriented um, bank, um, we always um, get, end up in discussions where basically the German and the Dutch authorities say we can only uh, impose uh, new, uh, new reforms if and when the other discussion about the, um, um, the big risks that we face in uh, especially the European periphery um, are so. What is your stance on that? And, and, and do you see any chance of, uh, of, of making any progress uh, there in the coming months? I know you know you're not allowed to speak about the future, but nonetheless, <laughs> I, I but it's not monetary was, policy, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wished I had a quiet period for European deposit insurance, Sorry. but unfortunately, I have not. Um, so um, now, ECB, we support the European deposit insurance scheme because a it is one of the components that will allow the management of banking problems to make more stable so that from our pure monetary policy angle, the whole banking system would function better if that was the case, we believe, okay, Un under certain designs, so which are discussed. Um, so we support it, but also because since 2014, we are a banking supervisor and from a purely, let's say, microprudential perspective for a moment, actually having a, a, a deposit insurance that is the same in every member state. So there are no distortions uh, due to some deposit insurances being stronger in some countries because of a better fiscal backing than others. Also from a potential angle, certain distortions are taken out if there is a common uh, deposit insurance. As an aside, um, ECB has made studies, has published a paper in which it argues, it makes some simulations that actually for most plausible scenarios of problems that can emerge, actually the cross-country transfers under the European Deposit Insurance Scheme as it is proposed, the EDIS, actually would be normally relatively small. It's actually in a very, very, very extreme case where actually large fiscal uh, payments would actually go across countries under the design that, that, has, that are, have been discussing. So um, now, how can we solve the, uh, the current uh, deadlock on, on the issue? Luckily enough, that is a job for a politician. And uh, uh, for your colleagues in the finance ministry of the Netherlands and in Germany and other countries, um, the current, the, 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 the deadlock, uh, the way I understand it is at present, that is about the question of whether the glass is half full or half empty. So uh, why are people not confident to, uh, uh, in some countries, to uh, agree to more support uh, support mechanisms like a deposit insurance? Because they think the risks are still too high in some banking sectors for some banks. Let's talk about non-performing loans and so on. Um, now, uh, uh, other countries uh, that have, have actually gone through, for example, Spain, like a program, or other countries, they have argued actually that capital had increased a lot, NPL, NPLs have gone down a lot already, so a lot has already been achieved. So we are already ready to introduce another support scheme because uh, the, the system is much safer today than it used to be. So, and in this, in this space between these uh, people who see the glass half full and the glass half empty, between legacy problems and uh, ideal institutions we would like to have soon, um, there has not been possible to strike a, 
uh, an agreement that led to a, a firm implementation of the European deposit insurance. And it's everybody's bet, everybody's view, um, kind of, uh, I would argue we should make more progress on some dimensions in some banking sectors on, um, a, on, the, on the NPLs, for example. But, uh, but at the same time, one should acknowledge uh, uh, where we are today compared to three, five years ago. Um, and, uh, and then there are, of course, different mechanisms you can deal with this. No? So you can, uh, and it is discussed, certain sovereign risk weightings on the asset side that would give more confidence to the countries that fear they have to pay too much and so on, maybe more often. This can be discussed. Now, whether the, when the political sector can agree on these things, it's everybody's bet. I cannot say. We support. We hope it will come. And it would make our life overall better in our mandate. The, what, what is our mandate? Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for uh, actively contributing to this open lecture. And thank you in particular to you, Philip, for uh, not only giving us a very comprehensive overview of what the ECB has done, but also for being uh, actually open about uh, the thoughts and questions that came here. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.